So, Michael, we've got some uh, award season news uh, to to report on. Um, of course, the Oscars happened uh, last week from when we were yes. recording this, and uh, Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. That, of course, is what's on everybody's minds. Indeed, we did a video about it, and yeah, uh, yeah it was fucking fucking crazy. But you know what else was crazy? Uh, we actually talked about it last week in our cold open for Nomadland when we talked about uh, Bruce Willis winning all those Razzies, if you remember. Oh, yes. I did hear. Yeah, I heard about Bruce Willis. Uh, is it he quit acting, right? Yeah. So he wins Razzies and then he quits. <laughs> Maybe the family was like, you know, we don't want to put him through this anymore. It's just embarrassing him. Like the Razzies was a wake up call. So he was like, OK, yeah. we'll retire. We'll, we'll retire Bruce Willis now. Um, I don't know why he was making all those movies. Of course, Red Light Media did a good job. On that, but yeah, he's uh, he he's not making movies anymore because of his uh, memory loss, unfortunately. Which, uh, as Red Letter Media pointed out, was you know you could tell in plenty of his movies like this hadn't hadn't suddenly sprung up upon Bruce Willis, but whatever. Uh, but the Razzies responded to this and rescinded their award to Bruce Willis due to his aphasia uh, diagnosis. So he no longer uh. yeah he no longer has a Razzie. So that information that I reported on last week. Not, no longer relevant, and they also just rescinded Shelley Duvall's Worst Actress nomination for The Shining, which again has been much talked about over the years, was completely ridiculous, uh, and now I don't know why, but after all these years, they finally got and done it. So there you oh, go. So Will Smith better watch out. Seems like they're uh, taking away people's awards now. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Select and Reflect, the movie review podcast where we look at films that have come out in the near and distant past, we give them a couple of watches and evaluate them beyond first impressions. I'm your host Michael and I'm joined as always by my co-host Luke and this week we are concluding our look at, um, well, the Oscar season in general by looking at the films that were nominated for Best Picture last year and we're doing our, I think we do quite often where we kind of mop up at the end by looking at two films which I guess we felt we probably have less to say about um than, than the other films which you gave full episodes to and this week we're looking at minari and the father but i believe we're starting off with so luke why don't you tell us a thing or two about the father uh yeah sure thing michael so uh, like you said we are of course reviewing uh these two movies uh to be honest there was quite a few movies we could have only done like in half yeah. an hour burst at this year's or last year's i should say uh oscar uh award ceremony uh mank and nomadland come to mind um, and maybe Judas and the Black Messiah as well. But yeah. that... I mean, the fact that Nomadland, like I was thinking that like we really didn't have, like I think we had more to say about, or I would have more to say about either of these two films than about Nomadland, but I guess Nomadland had to get its own one because it was the best picture. Yeah, one. oh, exactly. Yeah, of course. It won the best picture, so we had to review it. And of course, yeah, we. I think I gave it a uh, a six out of 10. What did you give it? Uh, Nomadland, I gave it a six too. Yeah, yeah Probably, so, I guess a low six. Yeah, and of course, we shall um, rank all last year's uh, best picture nominees in order what we think was the worst what we think was the best and therefore what should have won um and we will do that at the end and so yeah nomadland i don't think is going to be near the top of our list of course uh but let's see if the father is michael so the father or father the uh, <laughs> the father is a 2020 drama film co-written and directed by florian zeller in his directional debut this was his first ever movie michael as a director wow he co-wrote it with fellow playwrights christopher hampton based on zeller's 2012 play le pierre uh what do you think le pierre means in in french michael um what do i think it means uh oh oh the brother right no it means the father duh were you oh god you weren't joking oh my <laughs> no god. you know what it was okay here's the thing. see i thought it was gonna see what i remembered is that le frere means the father and for a minute oh, sorry fine I'm terrible. No, yeah, I you basically are messing this up. Yeah, yeah, I'm messing this up, you're right. But the important thing is like at first I thought that um that it was going to be like something where it wasn't the father and it was something interest like something else. So I was thinking, "Oh wait, what's the and then yeah, but you are right. That was stupid of me. Um and I do accept fully that that was unambiguously uh, stupid. Yes, so, I thought a nice little fun question. Oh, what does le pierre mean in French? <laughs> the brother, right. <laughs> Which, the fuck? Oh my god. Which is part of a trilogy that also includes La Fils and The Mother. Uh, so anyway, Michael, uh, this is a screenplay again by Florian Zeller. Um, you know, he's of course, I mean, it's incredible that he got nominated for a Best Picture with his first ever attempt at a directorial debut. But I guess the source material is very strong. Uh, the movie stars, which of course he also created the source material. So you know, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I guess maybe it wasn't his first play. 
Uh, yeah, I doubt it. Yeah, was. Sorry, well, it wasn't because you just said it was the third in a trilogy, right? Well, I said it's part of a trilogy. Oh, part of a trilogy. So okay. maybe. Well, actually, I'm looking at it now, and it wasn't. So, uh, La Pierre. Uh, was made in 2012, and prior to that, he'd done one, two, three, four, five. He'd done six plays yes. before then, so, so yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. impressive at all. And not impressive at all. Uh, but this movie, of course, stars Anthony Hopkins, Olivia Coleman, Mark Gattis, Imogen Poots, Rufus Sewell, or Swell. I don't, I'm, that's it's a hard name to pronounce. Yeah, I, I yeah, I know, and I never, I just sometimes I just commit to pronouncing it like really over pronouncing his name, being like Rufus Sewell, Sewell, and Olivia Williams as well. So, Michael, this movie was released on the 26th of May, 2021 in France. Somehow it qualified for the Oscars. I don't know how. Uh, And yeah, Michael, can you tell me uh, the budget for The Father? Right. Well, I need to point out two obvious things, which is that this film would have been quite cheap in a lot of aspects, like the fact it's almost entirely in like a flat. But it would have been, I guess, like I think the cast would have been a lot because obviously you've got these two pretty established famous directors of anthony hopkins and olivia coleman i'm guessing the cast is the overwhelming cost here um i'm not sure what that translates to though in terms of how much they would have actually been paid i mean i'm kind of like i'm kind of thinking five million oh good guess because the budget is six million okay good good so yes the budget is six million uh michael now it's time for the uh, for the box office uh, this movie, right. of course, re- was released in the summer. It was released in on the 11th yeah. of June 2021 in the UK. So, you know, it wasn't like in the winter, so COVID wouldn't have been a bigger deal. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it was just released in cinemas. I don't think... I watched it on Amazon uh, yeah. Prime, but I think it was... Then it went to Amazon after it was, uh, it was released. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so I was already going to speculate. I think this film probably probably did the best out of all the films nominated for best picture that's what my brain is telling me because i'm thinking like i feel like a lot of people obviously olivia coleman's speech in in the oscars for uh, the favorite was a really famous speech like lots of people who didn't even watch the oscars found out about that so if they then hear oh olivia coleman's in a new film and like anthony Hor- uh, anthony horowitz anthony hopkins was nominated for um for best actor or sorry one best actor uh, i feel like that must have done well. Like you've got, yeah, Olivia Coleman, really famous, great actress speech. Let's have a guess. Other guy won. So, like, I think it did really well. I don't really know what really well translates to. Um, significantly more than its budget, I think. Maybe. I wish I could remember. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I hope that this is not less than the highest anything else got. I'm not going crazy because, yeah, it was still just like whatever. You know, it's not like a blockbuster film. I want to say forty million. Okay, you know what? Not a bad guess. You're not getting a mark for more than double because uh, it's twenty eight point four. Okay, yeah. yeah. 20, 28.4 million was the box office total. Yes, I was worried you were going to say like 100 or something. No, like yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ, don't do it, Michael. Thankfully, you didn't. Uh, so, yes, the box office, 28.4 million. So, Michael, now it is time to get into whether we liked The Father. Did you? I I really liked this film. I thought it was a very well-made um, film that was uh, emotionally resonant. I think that's one way you can really kind of, and also kind of technically interesting, but uh, yeah, by a significant, many of these significant ways you would judge the quality of a film, this was a very good film. Yeah, movies that are based on plays are probably going to be pretty damn good. Yeah. Just because obviously the play, it's all about the screenplay. Um, yeah. And, not, and of course you could add, add in some stuff, particularly in musicals, you can add in more stuff, you know. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the writing has to be solid, the dialogue has to be solid. And if you can translate that to the to the big screen and shoot it well and you know have good performances then you're on to a winner and it is yeah emotionally resonant it is a very depressing movie but it's a movie that makes you feel and it's a movie yes. and you know if, if a movie makes you feel something then wow that's good that's that's it's done its job uh so we'll we'll just uh go through how or how critically acclaimed this movie was because you know like i said i i do like it and it's un- unsurprising after watching the movie, you know, just how well it was reviewed. So at the 93rd Academy Awards, of course, Anthony Hopkins won Best Actor. And we're mm, going to go through later yes. whether he whether he deserved that. And uh, I think he should have died if he wanted to get Best Actor. <laughs> and Zella and Hampton won Best Adapted Screenplay, of course. Uh, and that was, yeah, that that was uh, the the uh, the inkling that, uh, yes, Hopkins could, I guess, win Best Actor because clearly the Academy liked the father. Uh, but yeah, best adapted screenplay. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I I think that is definitely the case. Um, of all the uh, movies that were nominated in that category last year, I think this definitely deserves it. Uh, yeah. And the film received much more than. Uh, is it? Of course, you remember what original screenplay was? 
Promising young woman. Promising young woman. <laughs> Promising young woman and the father standing side by side. The best screenplay know, awards. So crazy. At the 2021 Oscars. Uh, the film received six nominations in total, including Best Picture and Best Supporting Actress for Olivia Coleman. Of course, she didn't win it. And again this year, she was nominated, but she didn't win it. You, know, you have, to, know, yeah. have to have a bit of a gap before you win it again. So, you know, just stop performing in good movies because you're wasting the opportunity. Yeah, that's what I kind of think. Yeah, if she would have like waited five years to be in this film, she could have won Best Actress. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, of course, um, it you know won a lot of awards at the uh, Golden Globes and at the Screen Actors Guild. And uh, interestingly, a follow-up film based on Zella's 2018 play at The Sun with Hopkins reprising his role as Anthony and Zella returning as writer and director is currently in production. Oh, so we'll see. <laughs> a father cinematic universe. Yeah, the father cinema, indeed, indeed. Uh, so let's, um, well, let's get into our nitpicks, Michael. How many do you have? I have uh, the grand total of zero nitpicks. Okay, I have one, which is actually, yeah, fine. Which is actually a lit pick. Oh, you, 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 you rascal, you. <laughs> uh, Anthony Hopkins, uh, of course, plays a character who has dementia in this movie, Michael. Oh, what is, um, what is, uh, what is, what is, what is this character's name? The character's name. Oh, yeah. you know what? I'm actually really embarrassed because I'm trying to like think of the. I would like it on the record, by the way. I watched this film, uh, yes, yesterday because you rearranged. But I can tell you that the character's name. Do you is have in dementia? Fact, you have dementia. Uh, oh goodness me! Yeah, of course. <laughs> I do remember it now. Um, because yeah, so yeah, I get you. And this is something you like, of course. He's the character's called Anthony. Yes. And yes. you like it when characters play or actors play characters who have the same name as them. And yes, and you forgot, and you that that fits into the theme of dementia of course in this movie yeah, that is so, true. Yeah, well yeah. done well done all full marks all around there for that yeah, yeah. so i think i should get a lit pick for forgetting what his name was yes but the funny thing is i was like my brain was saying charles Jesus <laughs> so I, was, Christ. I was considering taking a guess another like... fucking the brother moment then <laughs> i know moment. yeah uh yeah so anthony hopkins of course uh plays a character called anthony and that's great you know you don't do, do it too often now he can't play another character named anthony um, but you know, when you have a, a character who has the f- the first name of, a, or uh, yeah, yeah, I guess the first name, <laughs> the full name would be a bit too much. The first name of the actor who's playing them or actress, uh, and they of course, um, you know, are famous like Anthony Hopkins is. It makes sense. It just makes sense because everyone knows. Oh, that's Anthony Hopkins, one of the most famous and acclaimed actors ever. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, interestingly, I just saw this. His first name isn't actually Anthony. What Anthony Hopkins? Yeah, his first name's Philip. Uh, so oh. I guess it's one of those kind of go by your middle name sort of things, which you know people do sometimes. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, maybe there was another actor. That was it. Yeah, because they don't, oh, they can't yeah. have the same name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's like the Hugh Dennis thing. His actual name's Peter. Oh, really? Yeah, and yeah, basically, yeah, because they can't have the same name. Yeah. Classic. Yeah, then maybe that's it. But anyway, so Anthony Hopkins is called Anthony. Uh, so yeah, let's get into the uh, plot. So Anthony Hopkins is called Anthony in the movie. Just to clarify that. Yes. I know he's called that in real life as well. So concept uh, of this movie, Michael, and the plot. So uh, The Father is a uh, 2019 Bulgarian drama film directed by Kristina Grovica and Peter Valchenov. It was selected as the Bulgarian entry for Best International Feature Film at the 93rd Academy Awards, but it was not nominated. So, yeah, basically the plot is a son arrives late to the funeral of his own mother and becomes trapped in all the lives he has started. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. What, Fascinating. What, what'd you make of that? That sounds like it would be a, a really kind of intense and fascinating plot. Yeah. Uh, for for a film. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that's not the actual plot, though, is it? I know you're so... you're... <laughs> you're messing with me. No, see, the thing is, obviously, I you know you type in on Wikipedia the father, you know, and oh. you'll see there's a bunch of options. For, oh, for okay, the father, that's... and one of them below was a 2019 Bulgarian oh. drama film. And I thought, see, be... for, yeah, for a minute, I thought you were going to. I thought because you said the son, I thought maybe like you were talking about one of these films they've got in the father cinematic universe, and you're reading that out to mess with me. Oh no, no, no. So, well, I said Bulgarian drama film. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's not French, is it? Yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd say that because you know, oh, I got it wrong. I, oh shit, I I watched the wrong, the father. I'm sorry, I watched a wrong version of it, the Bulgarian version of it. Now, um, I'll tell you what actually happened, and I thought... Because, you see, there's also a, a movie called The Father, which is from Syria. Um, oh, really? Yeah, there's a bunch. Uh, that one was specifically called The Father. And so I, in the very legal website that I used, um, used to watch yes. these movies, I selected The Father, you know, to watch it, and instead it showed me a different movie. 
um that that and that some... became your favorite movie of all time well the thing is i thought it could because it had some middle eastern people in it and i thought oh is this the tw- is this the fucking syrian version of the father and whoever's you know done this has made a mistake but apparently <laughs> that wasn't the case so i just just a little funny aside the the movie that i tried to watch the father and the movie that it, in the very legal website that i use the caps you know kept playing in its place in all the in all the different options i had was a movie called uh name colon human um name human yes name human uh that that movie played instead which is a turkish movie so i was very confused at the start and the the, the plot of name human is the story takes place in the yeah. back in the back streets of galata uh m meli meli a transvestite yeah. who works as a singer in a classy nightclub finds an abandoned baby on his way back from work one early morning and takes him home. And I was thinking, this this is this isn't Anthony Hopkins. What is going on here? This Turkish transvestite. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the, the, I I was confused because the opening credits are like Turkish music and like a load of Turkish yeah. actors. I was like, you you were very confused when the transvestite didn't start uh, didn't turn out to be a serial killer. You're like, hold on a minute, this can't uh, be an Anthony Hopkins film. Yes, yes, they actually saved the baby instead of eating it. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a good Silence of the Lambs reference uh, but yes yeah. so uh, a man um, of course this is the actual plot of the father we'll get onto it now a man refuses yes. all assistance from his daughter as he ages as he tries to make sense of changing circumstances he begins to doubt his loved ones his own mind and even the fabric of his reality we see reality through the eyes of this elderly man who has dementia basically that's it and that is a very interesting concept for a movie and of course Anthony Hopkins mm. sells it very well yes yeah, I mean, the funny thing is, I actually wanted to say that when I first watched this film, uh, I didn't actually bother looking up the, uh, you know, kind of plot description or anything like that. So I spent some proportion of the film kind of like trying to work out, wait a minute, is he actually insane? Or is like there some kind of thing where like, is this almost like kind of a horror thing where like actually his family's taking advantage of him or messing with him? And eventually I obviously realized like, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was. Where I was like, but I was kind of going back and forward myself. So let me tell you, as somebody who went into this film not knowing for certain that it was about dementia, um, for a minute I was in that headspace too. I was like, oh wait a minute, what's happening here? Um, which was kind of actually enjoyable on my first watch. Yeah, like, you not s- quite knowing. You see, I don't know if that's either embarrassing, um, <laughs> yeah. just just on the level of you didn't get it or you didn't know what it was going into it, or, or it was actually great because you actually got to experience like his yeah. life through his eyes more than me, who of course I, I knew what it was about dementia when I watched started to watch the movie, so I knew what was going on right from the yeah. get go. Well, also I knew it was like by a French person, and I thought, well, you know, those French people they make like weird films. Um, so I was like, yeah. you know, like I wouldn't put it past him to make a film where it turns out like actually he's in some kind of weird cult, and like I don't know. At some point, someone will randomly get naked or something. That's the kind of thing they do. Those Europeans, like, uh, les cousins. Ah, oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, actually, no. It made me think about this film called Dogtooth, which is about this guy who like uh keeps his family in this secret compound and like lies to them about reality. Um, which is a great film. And of course, Cuties. Can't forget that great French movie. Oh, I love that. That was great. <laughs> Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> I, from what I can recall, you actually liked it more than me. Yeah, I did like uh, it more than you, that yeah. is true. Uh, so Anne visits... So this is what happens in the movie. To, we'll just kick us off at the start. So Anne visits her father, Anthony, in his flat after he has driven away the latest of several caregivers. He has dementia and constantly forgets important life events and where things around uh, are around his flat, including his watch. He tells Anne he believes his caregiver stole his watch and that he will never move out of his flat. She tells Anthony that she is moving to Paris to be with a man, which confuses Anthony as he does not recall any men in her life since the end of her marriage to James. Uh, Anne says if he keeps refusing to have a caregiver, she'll move him into a nursing home. Um, So the next day, Anthony encounters an unknown man, Paul, in his flat. Paul says he is Anne's husband, and that Anthony is living in their flat. Uh, Anne returns what appears to Anthony as a different woman. Uh, through the eyes of a dementia album man, basically, Michael, like I said, this is this movie. You all now understand what he's going through. And this is yeah. when it's like, well, I, I say this is when we, like, maybe for you it was a bit longer. But then this, for me, this is when I started to understand the concept of the movie. It's like, oh, okay, we're just seeing reality through this guy's eyes. Like, this is, yeah. and so this is what it's like to have dementia then. And that is like a really good idea. It's a really nice concept to to display in a movie, because uh, we don't know what's happening at all, do we? 
no yeah i mean it is yeah it is kind of mental because like in a way like i actually was um at the end of this film especially on my second watch i was thinking like so is she really dating rufus sewell um like is is he really her husband is he is he actually french um which was annoying it was kind of you know i'm not actually saying this is like a serious criticism but it was kind of like um you know i guess maybe it made you relate to the frustration of uh of anthony's situation more because i was sat there like so what's even happening what's happening with these people obviously you do find out i guess by the end that uh olivia Coleman's definitely gone to um france but yeah like almost everything else in the film is just like oh you have no idea what's going on which, yeah. Um, yeah so this this, in that headspace. this presents an issue for us really because of course when we review movies we go through the plot you know yeah and there isn't a constructive like plot at all really it's just like things are happening and he's getting confused over and over again and you as a viewer the i guess the fun of it and maybe fun is the wrong word but you're you're trying the to piece, enjoyment the enjoyment i guess you're trying to piece together the stuff and you're realizing, oh, this is the world he's living in, and uh, he's just he just remembers bits and pieces, and it's all it's all a massive border confusion. Uh, and of course, that's really effective in communicating how difficult it must be to have dementia. Uh, so, writing for Variety, Owen Gleiberman said, "The father does something that few movies about mental deterioration in old age have uh, brought off in quite this way or this fully. Uh, it places us in the mind of someone losing his mind." And it does so by revealing that mind to be a place seemingly rational uh, and coherent experience. Uh, so yeah, mm. other place seemingly rational and coherent experience. That's the thing you, like you said, Michael, your experience is great because I didn't know, well, I knew it was about dementia, sorry, you didn't. So you yeah. were like, oh, he's being rational about everything basically at the start. Like, why yeah. are people changing like <laughs> appearances? Like that must be yeah. very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for a minute, like, yeah, my, my main thought was like, is like his, his daughter trying to or like, is it not really his daughter? Has he been, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, I was like thinking there was something, like I was in a position where I was like, oh, I could believe there's something sinister going on with like the people around him. And then obviously you realize, oh wait, it's just that he's yeah. freaking out. Yeah, it's a, no wonder he's like paranoid and everything because yeah, as, as a neutral, someone who's coming to the movie blind, I think again, yeah. it's a good, it's the best way to experience the movie properly. And you're like, oh, okay, is this guy just being like, you know, is is that a horror movie, like you said, or whatever? Yeah. No. So, so like, imagine you're in that space. It yeah, must yeah, feel, that's true. Yeah, yeah. It must feel like you are in a horror movie, and it just must be an awful experience. Really, again, communicating the, um, just just how awful you know dementia dementia truly is. Mm. Uh, so yeah. I yeah. actually I have a question about so this is like a question which I feel like your answer is probably going to be no, and you're probably going to judge me. But did you find any part of this film kind of funny, kind of comedic? not really no okay so so the thing is for me it wasn't like the thing is i want to stress that for me it wasn't like i loved it because i thought it was like you laughed when or, or bad i you laughed when james gassis slapped him <laughs> no not really no um no i i i found um so like when anthony was kind of like doing some of like his old man kind of like uh like funny stuff like um or like for example the whole like the recurring they don't even speak english in in france where it's just like yeah. they don't even speak english there and like when he started repeating it like i kind of yeah so i found it like funny and like uh Oh yeah, more like a kind of, I guess like bittersweet kind of way, where it's kind of like obviously because mm. especially on my second watch, I knew the film didn't have a funny ending, but even so, it's kind of like the moments where he was being kind of like uh, a funny guy, like you know doing his little tap dancing and all that funny stuff and making fun of the French for speaking the wrong language. But yeah, obviously, um, overall, yeah, I wouldn't describe this film as a comedy of any sort. But yeah, I just wanted to say that's something I experienced. I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of there is like a certain funniness to it, a certain comedic aspect. Yeah, but not yeah. much. I guess so. Yeah, a bit, a bit perhaps. But anyway, uh, writing for Variety, Owen Gleiberman, who I've referenced quite a lot, um, said yeah. the, fa- the father does so shit. No, I just said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I referenced. God, I have dementia because I yeah. that was the wrong fucking uh, movie critic. Because now we're on to for the Guardian, Benjamin Lee, uh, wrote Hopkins performance. Uh, it's astounding, heartbreaking work watching him try to rationally explain to himself and those around him what he's experiencing. In some of the film's most quietly upsetting moments, his world has shifted yet again, but he remains silent, knowing that any attempt to question what he's woken up to will only fall on deaf ears. And of course, we'll go on to that, his his performance later, uh, in specifically. Mm. But yeah, I, I do like that aspect when he's just, he knows that something isn't right and he's confused and he just is like, yeah, okay, fine. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's just fine. You know, I, I won't say anything because nobody's going to listen to me. And yeah, it's that's and it, he communicates very well, and the screenplay does it too, as does his performance. Of course, it all does combined, like the the helplessness and the, just the frustration 
of yeah. no- nothing making sense around you. And if you point it out, nobody will care at all. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. I, I really, yeah, I really like that, and I do think, yeah, you kind of get the sense of yeah, the character just having to deal with this situation because obviously, I mean, there's no escape from it because it's literally inside his own head. Yeah, you can't escape from that, uh, which yeah, obviously is uh, both you know yeah very emotionally resonant let's say realizing he's in that situation yeah uh, i like the aspect where you know he he sees his like um uh daughter as a different person to uh to what she normally looks like in her appearance and of course uh, her husband as well and uh, yeah obviously you know he can't remember anything at all it's like a i don't know if you imagine can you imagine a slinky michael a slinky yeah in terms of in terms of the pattern so it's like um well what i mean it's like a circle and then it loops back on itself yeah 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 i got you yeah and it keeps and it keeps doing that basically and it keeps looping that that's what it's like in, in this movie yeah. um, so you, you go forward in time then you go back and then you go further forward in time to where you've been before and you go back in time again etc that's kind of how it's like and uh yeah uh, just from wikipedia over the course of the film it becomes clear anthony has really been living with Anne for years, but he believes he still owns his own flat. After Anne comes, she and her husband, who is sometimes called Paul and sometimes James, uh, appears as two different men. Uh, And of course, they have an argument over a holiday that had to be cancelled because of Anthony's needs and about Anne's sacrifices for her father. And then Paul asks Anthony how long he plans to stay in the flat and annoy everyone. This sequence of events is repeated later, again, Mm. like like the loop. And on the second occasion, Paul slaps him. Uh, so, Michael, what what, what do we think? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's really well done, especially yeah, with like the dinner yeah. table conversation in particular. Is like just that was like I think that was like the biggest kind of Loop. just whoa, uh, like yeah. wow, that was that was like clever the way they did that because you didn't yeah. see it coming at all. And then just happened like oh wow, he's just really losing his mind. Um, I think that's probably like yeah, just almost like the best way I've ever seen a film just like fully display somebody's kind of like yeah, losing their mind. Um, yeah. And yeah, I really like that. And obviously, yeah, the, the other stuff with um, you know, when he when he gets slapped, um, also very uh, yeah, well done. That that aspect yeah. of the filmmaking is very clever. Yeah, yeah, the slap when it's like he actually, this is how he actually, I guess, feels when he's been questioned by Paul. Like it's like yeah. Paul slapping him. And I don't, yeah, I don't imagine in real life Paul actually would would slap. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I do find it funny how like Paul, like when she walks in and like the dad's crying, he's just got Paul, and like imagine yeah. if Paul if Paul actually was just slapping him. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Exactly. But that's uh, again. That's how he. That's how he feels. Like and that's how he's. He's remembering it because I guess that's. Yeah. That's in the moment. That's what he was like being bombarded, and yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. It's of course the looping in the dinner scene that 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 was great as well. And of course, you know, he believes it's still his own flat. He still talks about Anne's flat like it's his own flat. And uh, like you say, yeah. That's. Um, well, you you were going to make a point about that, weren't you, Michael? Oh yeah, yeah, the flat. Um, yeah, I just thought it was really clever how like the flat kind of moves around. And to be honest, there were like several points. Like this is another example of how it kind of gets in your head. There were several points where I was like, kind of thinking, oh, has the flat changed or is that the same? Because you know, obviously, it's kind of hard to tell. But like, yeah. there was a particular scene where it's kind of like they walk out of a room and like they're looking down the hall one way, and then it looks as if that's like the wrong room. And then obviously, it's a bit where it's like there's a bit that has been previously established to be like where his bedroom is, but then there's a closet there all of a sudden. But then, yeah, there are other moments where it's kind of like, you're kind of working out, wait, is there like a subtle thing going on where he, the, the house is slightly different? Or, you know, am yeah. I just thinking that? So yeah, it's really clever that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, um, we'll, we'll get on to the end now. So obviously this woman who has appeared as his carer, uh, who was of course uh, Laura, that was her actual name. And this um, and appeared as uh, his daughter, Anne, who of course um, uh, was played by Olivia Coleman. Um, this woman at the end, who has appeared as these two characters, is actually, of course, the care home woman. Yes. And yeah, slowly she'll basically replace his daughter in his memory. Basically, uh, I guess is what's what what is uh, occurring there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Anthony, of course, at the end of the movie, just the conclusion breaks down in tears of his inability to understand what is happening, as well as Anne's disappearance. He says he wants his mother and that he is losing his leaves the branches, the wind, and the rain. Uh, Catherine comforts him and tells him she will take him out to the park later. And yeah, it is a uh, it is a very depressing ending, and it just really hammers, like you say, it's, it, it's emotional, makes you feel something, Michael, which is why it's so good. Like The, the ending really nails it as, as much as it can. And yeah, it just makes the point so well about how, honestly, heartbreaking it is to live with depression. Uh, so not depression yeah, dementia <laughs> dementia i guess depression as well but yeah the ending's depression uh depressing and yeah it must be awful to live with dementia it just must be 
the most horrible thing in the world. And yeah, this movie makes it that point as well as it ever could. Um, so yeah, what would you make of the Yeah, end? yeah. I mean, it was kind of interesting because I was thinking a little bit about Manchester by the Sea, which is obviously also another very sad film we've reviewed. But in that, there's kind of like an ending where like he's kind of sort of starting to open up to the world and you kind of get that impression that he's like, you know, slightly, you know, you get the impression he could improve. Obviously, the sad thing about this film is you know that he's not going to get over it. Like, basically, he's just like, that's it until he dies now. I don't think there really is a cure for dementia. So that's why it's kind of like, it's not just like sad in the context of like the film having a sad ending, but it's also like kind of the extra level of, you know, a film could have a sad ending and you can kind of, you know, convince yourself, oh, but maybe it works out for them afterwards. Uh, you know, there's loads of films that have sad endings. You're like, well, you know, I'm sure they get their life back on track eventually. Uh, this film has a sad ending and you know that in any reality where this film would continue onwards, it's just going to continue to be like that for him. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, that makes it kind of an extra level of sadness. Yeah, it ain't getting any better in it. There's, there's no way out, I guess. Uh, which is, yeah, the, the, the horrible part of it. And yeah, he just, I guess, has to just wait until he dies. And then he won't be feeling like that anymore. Um, he won't be feeling anything. And that's that's the depressing part of it. It's just like, oh, yeah, he's that's it for the rest of his, his life. And yeah, d- dementia is, is truly awful. Of course it is. And this again, this movie displays that incredibly well, as does the performance of Anthony Hopkins, oh, yes. who, of course, won Best Actor ahead of Chadwick Boseman. Mm. <laughs> um, and yeah, he was he was asleep in, uh, at, at the time, which I, I just love when he received his Best Actor uh, award. And yeah, of course, very different. You compare his his uh, performance at last year's Oscars after winning Best Actor and Will Smith's at uh, this year's Oscars after winning Best Actor. Very different in how they how they presented themselves that night while winning Best Actor, yes. But yeah, yeah, he, oh, yeah. Well, that just made me think, like, what if somebody got, like, the Will Smith slap so it was Anthony Hopkins getting slapped to the father? You know what, I, interestingly, because um, he presented the award for Best Actress afterwards, Anthony yeah, yeah, Hopkins. That's true. So he was there at the ceremony that night and he, he quoted Will Smith um, not, not the get my wife's name out of your fucking mouth part. Yeah. He was talking about acting, and he said he said uh, Will Smith said this bloody blah, blah blah, and I think that's right. And everyone applauded. So that was maybe him trying to just you know smooth things over, given what had happened. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, uh, Anthony Hopkins, of course, um, he won his second Academy Award for Best Actor at age 83, becoming the oldest Best Actor winner ever. Um, what was his first, Michael? Um, oh, Science of Lambs. Yeah. But- even though he yeah. wasn't really a lead in that movie. Yeah, I was actually surprised. I was going back and looking. He hasn't actually been in that many films. Like, considering yeah. how famous of an actor he is, uh, I did find out he does the narration in a, in the Grinch movie starring Jim Carrey, which he <laughs> shockingly didn't win. I know, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. his narration. But yeah, it's yeah. like, it's shocking because he's done, like, obviously he's done some other, like, films in the Hannibal universe. But he really, yeah, he hasn't done as, like, because, yeah, when you think about it, like, oh, Anthony Hopkins, really famous guy. And you're like, how many films has he actually been in, though? And the answer is not that many that you'd kind of know of. Yes, yes. Anyway, so um, do you think he... I mean, I, I think it's a great performance, Michael. You know, it feels... This movie feels very real, like... Uh, his acting is a part of it. He just gives an incredible performance. And yes, some did say it was the finest of his career, which, considering, of course, his performance in Silence of the Lambs is quite something. Uh, what, what do you think? I would definitely say it was, um, yeah, the finest of his career because, you know, I think Silence of the Lambs was good, but yeah, I think this had, like, a lot more subtlety to it and just a lot more, kind of... Just a lot more going on. Um... It was, yeah, it was really good. Uh, and I, I would say probably that I think he should have got Best Actor for it. Um, yeah, I admittedly I haven't watched Ma Rainey's Black Bottom since, uh, well, since last year. So okay. I can't really remember. But yeah, my instincts would say that he definitely deserved to win. Yes, yes. And yeah, uh, obviously, Silence of the Lambs, the father. Those his, I mean, again, like Will Smith. For instance, I just bring him up because he won recently in King Richard. Many people were like, not the best performance, really. Did he really deserve to win Best Actor? But Anthony Hopkins, Silence of the Lambs, and this movie. It's like, oh yeah, like those those Oscars are earned, very yes. much so. Uh, so anyway, Michael, that is it. And uh, now it's time to, we won't conclude really on The Father. We'll just give it a quick rating and a, and a quick one-sentence conclusion. So I think it's an 8 out of 10. Uh, I think it's a very strong movie in, of course, what it's trying to display. You know, its main goal is this is how awful dementia truly is, how heartbreaking it is, how confusing it must be. And you really, you know, you, you put yourselves in the shoes of Anthony Hopkins in this movie. And yeah, you, you do understand all the horrible aspects to uh, to to living that life. And yeah, that's that's what it seeks to do. And it does it incredibly effectively. So an eight out of ten for me uh, for that. What about you? I was honestly feeling a, a low nine, actually. Okay. Um, 
Uh, and you know yeah either high eight or low nine and that's mostly because i think like the kind of the filmmaking and kind of the use of film as a medium i think is really there in terms of like some of the kind of clever stuff that's done i think that's always something i like to see in a film like using the medium well uh and then of course the acting is great and also yeah for me emotional resonance is something that i, I really do enjoy you know when i watch a film i like to i like to feel um okay. so yeah for me yeah yes yeah, yeah. No, I get that. I yeah, I think what the reason why I'd probably rate it lower is because it's it does that again it very well effectively. But you know, like it's it is quite niche in terms of like it's got quite a limited focus, I guess you could yes, say. Yes, yes, it yeah. is quite a limited focus, and to get higher, you need to like go further with what what you do. But you know, I'm not saying obviously it's about eight out of ten. You know, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like four out of five. It's a very very solid movie, and again, but yeah, it just just because of its limited focus, like you say, I think it can really go higher. It's like only one and a half hours, which I which I like by the way, you know. But I'm just saying, you know, if it were to go higher, like uh, like well, the movie which is higher, my number one, it would have to it would have to do more. But it, what what it does do is very good. But anyway, let's move on to Minari now, Michael. Minari, Minari. Uh, so. Uh, Minari, Michael Minari. Uh, what 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 did you think of Minari? Actually, you know, I'll just go through the Wikipedia thing because, of course, you know, might as well. Uh, so it's a 2020 American drama film, written and directed by Lee Isaac Chung. It stars Stephen Yuen, Han Yi Ri, uh, Alan Kim, Noel Kate Cho, Yu Yun Yu Jung, Will Patton, and was released uh, on the February 12, 2021, in the United States. And yeah, Michael, can you tell me what the budget was for Minari? Uh, I think this would have been lower, uh, because while obviously there was, I guess, more stuff of kind of like, you know, slightly more stuff to actually include rather than just a flat, I don't think that the actors are as high profile. So I'm kind of thinking, let's say if... One of them maybe... was in The Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah, I do know that. I don't know if that really amounts to that much. I mean, maybe that's something, yeah. but... Go on, have I, I could be about to be wrong, but my brain is saying like three million. Uh, two million, so... Okay. Yeah, fair, good guess. Uh, quite close. Uh, and yeah, can you tell me what you think this movie raked in at the box office? Did Minari? Uh, by the way, just to, to just to tell you, I think this movie, yeah, this movie wasn't released on Netflix or Amazon Prime Island. It went to the uh, went to theaters. Yes. Okay. Well, my brain is telling me this film made less than um, what's it called? The other the film. Uh, yes. And did that make twenty eight million? Did you say? Yes. I guess I'm going to say this film made. I, I don't think this film would have even got that. My brain telling me it wouldn't have even got that close, but. Um, I'm going to go for 16 million. Oh, that's a very good guess. That might be one of your best ever guesses because it's a tough movie to, to place and its actual box office was 15.5. So yeah, that's a extremely good guess. You know, only half a million off. So well done, Michael. Yeah, you're on form today with these guesses. Yeah, I really am. Yeah, so well done. Let's guess some more budgets. <laughs> no, we've only we've already done two today. We have, yeah. to, we have to calm it down. So anyway, Michael, did you like Minari? Yes, I liked this film. Uh, again, lots of lots of good things. There was so acting good, emotional resonance good. Um, like some of the shots and like how pretty it looked good. Um, and also there was a lot of stuff to kind of uh, I guess digest on kind of like an, an intellectual level. Like some some ideas explored, some what you might call in the business themes. Uh, some interesting relationship dynamics. Lots of stuff that you would want to see to keep you interested in the film. And I was very much interested and enthused by this film. All right. Okay. Wow. I wasn't really that interested as much as you then. Okay. That's I didn't realize you were racist. Yeah, that, that okay, is Okay. That's it. interesting because I wish I could remember what film you rated high um, because when you said your favorite film, I was thinking, oh, is Luke going to rate this film? Like, is Luke going to no. say this one's a 10 out of 10? No, no, no. Not a 10 out of 10. That would be ridiculous. But I thought, is Luke going to say like this film's like, because um, to be honest, I can't remember all the different scores. But yeah, that's fine. That's I mean, fine. I want to stress that I, I liked this film. And I think it had a lot there. I mean, I liked it as well. Not just like, th- yeah. it had some issues. I, I will compare it to Nomadland. Uh, I think it's a better movie than Nomadland. Yeah. But it has some of the same problems that I identified in Nomadland. That's the same with this movie. Uh, but anyway, we'll we'll go into nitpicks now. Uh, first up, Michael, uh, what, well, how many what do, do we, have? Yeah, do we have? I, I've got one, which is a very tentative nitpick. Yeah, I've got one as well. So you go first. Okay, so it's basically just the fact that I found a bit weird that like he could just access the county's water so easily, and I kind of felt like that should have been something that was set up because they kind of and I I mean you could say this isn't really like I'm not this is almost like I'm not sure if this is a nitpick you could say maybe this is like a bigger problem or you could say it's not really a problem at all but like I was kind of thinking like him not being able to have water was kind of like this big thing at the beginning and then just like as soon as like then this just access to county water seems to just appear out of nowhere i just feel like it would have been a little bit better if like at some point you would have seen oh they have access to county water but he shouldn't be using it 
okay. um, or whatever. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, my nitpick is a nitpick on on the film because it made me feel racist. Uh, oh. Yeah, because I was gonna say. I, I I can't can't remember when I was going to put this in the review, but I was going to be like, "Oh, you ain't no parasite, you know, you're not winning best picture." And then I was like, "Oh, wait, actually, this is an American film. This isn't a Korean film." That is a good point. Yeah, you are uh, racist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is. So I can't even compare it to. Par- Why would I compare this to Parasite, Michael? I can't because it's yeah, it's, it's, not, got it's an nothing American to do with. Yeah, exactly. These these are American people living in America. And as soon as you step foot in America, you become 100% American. That's why, and I want to stress this, no American has ever referred to their, their old world heritage um, in excess, even yeah. when they have a ridiculously tenuous connection to the country they claim to actually be from. Yeah, at least these, these people actually speak Korean. Yeah. So I'm one of them. One of them hey, are you saying I'm not Irish? I mean, that would be Italian, I guess. Yeah, I know, but maybe but I you're making. Of, I don't know, a lot of the Irish people are also from New York, right? Well, I was going to say maybe you're making fun of the fact that, you know, they all sound similar, and even though they stink, they're very distinct. That's like exactly Irish. what I was doing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we, we got different types of pizza. You know, it's like crazy. It's like a different country. <laughs> I okay, went to Chicago. Right. It was like being in uh, it was like being in africa they were so different oh that's kind of racist I meant to yeah just because it was very different. why don't you just calm down for a second and let me go through what what minari won the accolades it got yes so uh minari uh received critical acclaim one of the best films of 2020 apparently it earned six nominations at the 93rd academy awards best picture best director best original score best original screenplay best actor for yoon and best supporting actress for yoon there, those are two different <laughs> yin oh. and yoon uh, and of course, Yun, Yun. Uh, with Yoon, that's the grandma, winning for her performance. Of course, Brad Pitt gave her the award, uh, making yes. her the first Korean to win an Academy Award for acting. But not the first Korean to win an Academy Award, because of course that happened last year, didn't it? Yes, yes. To, Bong Joon-ho. Um, Park Yoon Ho. Bong Joon Ho. Uh, Did you I actually get that name wrong? Oh, wow, you were being racist. Okay. Well, well it's just, you know, I thought like I had a pretty good chance of being right. It was tactical racism. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, tactical racism, that's a good one. So, uh, Minari, what is this movie about? It's a, it is a tender and sweeping story about what roots us. Uh, Minari follows a Korean-American family that moves to Arkansas uh, in search of their own American dream. Uh, the family home changes completely with the arrival of their sly, foul-mouthed, but incredibly loving grandmother. Amidst the instability and challenges of this new life in the rugged Ozarks, Minari shows the undeniable resilience of family and what really makes a home. What really makes a home is, of course, family, the people you are living It's beautiful. With. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. yeah and I'm houseless, I, but I'm not homeless. Oh, yes, again. That's another comparison to Nomadland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it is a the, the key thing with this movie, it is a semi-autobiographical take on Chung, who is the director, Lee Isaac Chung, his upbringing. So I imagine he moved from South Korea, or his family were from South Korea. Uh, yeah, so, so the plot follows a family of South Korean immigrants who tried to make it in the rural United States during the 1980s. Yeah, I doubt they were from North Korea, or the movie would have taken on a very different tone. Yeah, that is true, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so a South, South Korean family moving to America. And yeah, it feels, again, because it's you know semi-autobiographical, like it feels very real. Like this life that the director is showing us like you know the father chasing the american dream and the mother you know who who doesn't want to move to a new place that's clearly not working um just just basically like all those immigrants like hundreds of years ago who traveled across this land as well uh, except they're doing it in the 1980s uh in uh yeah coming from korea and obviously yeah this movie basically follows their life you know them getting used to america going to church drinking mountain dew um yes. it's it is kind of entertaining as it you know it does like i say feel very real all the little details that basically i imagine lee isaac chung has picked up from his life or uh, from living in arkansas when he was when he was younger or where, where whichever state he lived in when he was no younger. it was uh, i actually so i found this it says uh, his family lived briefly in, briefly in atlanta before moving to a small farm in rural lincoln arkansas ah maybe he's a fan he attended fan. lincoln high school Maybe he's an Atlanta Falcons fan because the Atlanta Falcons kicker is Korean. Uh, yeah, he's 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 Korean, so that's interesting. But yeah, it it feels like an an authentic experience, and yeah, it's inherently interesting. This Korean family moving to Arkansas in the nineteen eighties. It's a bit of a, a weird thing to to. What a fish out of water story. Yeah, but quite fish out of water, quite. But I think this movie does show very well, like what you know. It feels it feels very real. You know, that's that's the best thing you can say. Uh, about it in the opening stages michael what, what would you say no yeah yeah it definitely does like this film it, it yeah it it feels like you're just 
I mean, yeah, I don't want to just repeat you, but yeah, it feels it feels real. Um, and obviously, uh, yeah. what else did you have to say about it? Because what else did I have to say about it? Well, yeah, I think mainly like the thing I, I liked about it is um, that also, yeah, the kind of dynamics felt like between the different members of the family uh, felt real as well. It all it yes. all felt very real. I also, I mean, I think also I liked the um, uh, some aspects of like the slow pace, especially like showing kind of like the long shots of like the nature. I think it really does show that that beauty like nomadland yeah that is, yeah uh i i think obviously for me i mean i suppose maybe we should try and well i don't know should i set this film apart from nomadland or do you have any more comparisons to nomadland you'd like to make well i will say a, a bad look i'll just say the character the character dynamic is good of course with nomadland it's really just fun really so that's what what's better about this movie is that you do get like um uh this uh yeah these character dynamics and that. yeah the the, the grandma is an interesting character. David, the the kid, is annoying. Really, really pisses me off. I don't know why, Michael. Just, he has just... health issues. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, so, so um, but the issue, I think, with the movie is that um, farming difficulties, you know, that's the only real plot, like, thread throughout the movie. It's just like a, a time in the life of this young Korean kid and this, and this family. And after a while, you do kind of start to tire of it you know it just, just being hey this is what this south korean family experienced in 1980s america and it just feels like at some stage it's like okay i get it all right you know it's i, I get this is this is what you experienced you know you, it, it was difficult it was unusual and yeah the, the the farming difficulties again that's the only real plot thread throughout the movie that's and of course that's re- related to the, the guy's uh, marriage of course yeah 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 and yeah that's that's just basically that that's it, and it's like I I would prefer if there was more plot going on, uh. But basically, uh, I I think I can't remember when it was like an hour or so, and a bit in. I was like, okay, can, you know, I'm, maybe maybe it's when the, yeah the kid went to when uh, David went to his uh his friend's house for the night, and oh, yeah. it was just and it showed him like the the breakfast scene. And it was like oh this is who he had to grow up with, on all of that like oh it's so different to what he's experienced. And I was like okay right I get it. It's different. It's weird. It's Arkansas. It's not California or Korea. But yeah, anyway, what would you have to say? That episode that basically like No Man Landing, there was a very thin thread of a plot throughout it. Um, yeah, I mean, well, so obviously, yeah, you mentioned the marriage thing um, as kind of like extending from that. But I would argue, I mean, I think like the way that things do extend from that makes makes it a bit more interesting. I mean, the thing is, I think what I like about this film more than No Man Land is that it, it has these uh, few things, but it does stick with them so you do kind of get like a sense of completeness like and obviously for example you've got like the kids health issues again you could say it's like a small thing but like they, they have the whole don't run david he's called david don't run and then like obviously then he has the bit where he runs and, he has, and then like obviously then you get the bit where it's like oh actually no it turns out that he's doing he's doing better and again you could say well that's not much but um it's at least i think that's something which i would say makes it I mean, it's better fine than I, 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 like the fact that you have things and obviously for example like the marriage stuff the wife's complaining about like the situation right at the beginning and then and throughout the movie yeah and then yeah basically that's what i'm saying like, at least um and obviously you have the relationship between the boy and his grandma like the thing the film when it introduces something pretty much carries it out to its kind of conclusion whereas i would say by contrast with nomadland i would almost say it barely even introduced that much and you know so okay, i could yeah, like, probably th- point to like if, if you said what are some like plot threads in this film i could point to quite a few it does, it does, it does carry out its conclusion. But that's the thing: the plot thread of like the kid and his heart. It's not really a. Th- it doesn't really. There's no. It doesn't end up, you know, with anything. Oh, he his heart improved. That's great. You know, I guess. But, but you know, there's no like payoff for that. Um, and yeah, it just it, it does come to its conclusion. I guess a lot of the threads like eventually, eventually it does, after a while. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, well, there are some themes, I guess, which again, makes it better than Nomadland. Uh, you, the Christian guy I liked, Michael. The Christian yeah, yeah, guy. yeah. He, he was interesting. Like, I especially, and again, you also, I mean, this film did have like a comedic element to it, um, with especially like when he does the, the, the differences. Yeah. Um, oh, the exorcism. Yeah. And like, get out, out. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's fun. Um, and Did obviously, you have anything more to say in the Christian stuff? Um, well, you know, I mean, I think, uh, well, I mean, obviously it's kind of weird because it's almost like um like you you almost feel like the fact there is the religious stuff and then you almost like it's almost like does does the film almost hint at miracles i don't know see the thing is like what i'm kind of thinking about is like how like the kids starting to get healed um and the fact that like but then and then obviously you've got the fact like the thing burns down but then they still have the minari 
And it's like, oh, look, the, the Minari saved there. Like, it does almost like, um, I know that when we mentioned, when we spoke about uh, Slumdog Millionaire, you, you mentioned that one of the things we were doing about was like the, the providentialism, like the idea that there's some kind of like higher power working behind the scenes. And I feel like in a way the film, it almost seems to have that going on, but not in like any kind of dramatic way. But there's, I don't know, there's like this weird sense in this film, of like things kind of working out, which I almost... Well, the grandma sacrifices herself, doesn't she? Yeah, exactly. Like a hero. Um, but no, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, the religion stuff, I mean, obviously, it's mostly just uh, kind of, I guess, an aspect of the character. And I suppose, I mean, it's a bit interesting because I'm not really sure, like, obviously, the husband's very cynical about the religious stuff, while his wife's clearly, like, into it. Um and, you know, I I, I I don't know, yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting because obviously then you've got the farm stuff where the wife's cynical, but the husband's really into it. So isn't that an interesting interesting little uh, give and take situation? And I guess the message there is that a farm is like a church. If you go out and you water those seeds and you plant them by spreading the gospel, eventually you will reap the rewards of, of eternal salvation. Is that what they taught you and in church? Now we will pass the collection. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do agree. I the think it's stuff. It's not like um, it's interesting. It's interesting all that stuff. But I, I guess, but yeah, I'm not sure they really flesh it out. Yeah. If that is the case. Um, but you talked about the Minari, of course. One of the aspects I did like, of course, Michael is Minari. What is it? It actually means water celery in in mm. in English. Uh, but of course, you know what Minari is a metaphor in this movie for Michael. Co- Korean culture. No. <laughs> It's not a metaphor for Korean culture. Uh, it's it's a metaphor for family. So, oh. yeah, I, I believe that is the case. So it's enjoyed by, of course, rich... You know, she goes on a long rant, the grandmother, enjoyed by rich and poor people, grows everywhere like weeds, can be put in a stew or soup, you know, can be medicine if you're sick. You know, it's just, just basically like fa- family can do a lot for you, basically. Family can do everything. And you can rely... You can rely on family, Michael, always. And, and they can rely on Minari. Yes, and of course, that is the, the central, I think, theme to the to the movie because of course you know jacob admits to monica that the success of his crops is, is more important to him than the stability of their family and they have an emotional argument and the two agree to separate and yeah i i enjoyed that drama by the way that was that was a good drama yeah it was yeah just like, I like that you know if it happened like sooner you know and that was it, yeah it was just a bit of a bit too much of a gap really uh but yeah it, it feels very again real like i said that's great about it but of course, then uh, the grandma accidentally sets the barn containing the produce on fire in their absence, and yeah. I didn't, I didn't really know about that because it seems quite forced. Well, yeah, yeah, it's... I do kind of agree with you. It kind of, it did seem a little bit like cliche, um, or like a bit kind. Of, I guess also kind of like melodramatic in a way. Yeah, but the thing is, I it's it's a good plot device, but just the way they get to that plot device, the way they introduce it, I just think is a bit shit. But uh, but anyway, uh, they arrive home, and Jacob rushes in to save the crops, and Monica of course soon follows eventually the fire grows out of control and they decide to save each other while leaving the barn to burn so yeah basically jacob does make the choice you know the literal choice the very literal choice to save his wife over the crops and you may be like ah that's not really subtle is it it's like the least subtle thing ever but i'm fine with that i guess it's like the end of the movie it's like a big moment i i, I don't mind that really and uh yeah of course he proves he does actually care about his family more and he doesn't uh, value the the crops over his family he he makes the makes the right choice and of course at the end of the movie you know um he, he goes out and what does he do michael he, he's getting the minari isn't he because yes. you know minari, the Min- minari is reliable just like family is reliable you know you can basically you can always fall back on it that is the most important thing that is the lesson that these immigrant families learned like the ones from south korea and it is a nice wholesome message to end the movie like wherever you, like home isn't like this specific place like home is just when you're with your your family and you know those those immigrant families they had to that's the thing they can rely on their family to get themselves through these uh these tough times uh mm. it's, it's always it's always there the crops may fail or the things may go bad but the, that minari that minari will will always be there so yeah minari is is like family which again it's a very nice message very nice ending like the father yeah it'll be that well it's, it's unlike the father and that it's well, like, it's a happy ending. Yes, yes. Well, what I mean is it's a very good way to end the movie. Both good endings displaying their theme, the message of the movie, very well. I think. Yes. Uh, no, yeah, I, I really like that. And um, also, we have mentioned the... Sorry, sorry. The thing is, what we didn't mention, though, is, like, the uh, the funny bit, and I think it needs to be mentioned, when the woman's, when the little girl says, can you tell me when I say something in your language? Oh, yeah, Xing the racism chong, wong, wong, bing bong, tong kong. Yeah. That was funny, yep. wasn't it? That's a good purpose gay bit. We'll do that. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, yeah, I do like that. Um, yeah, 
that aspect of um yeah you, you've convinced me with the with the fact that the minari is a perfect metaphor for family that um yeah that is yeah that is really uh that does a little add a little something extra um so yeah it does i agree i i i really do agree uh, but anyway, Michael, it is of course time to uh, t- time to go through our uh, our ratings. Well, actually, let's conclude. Basically, I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll conclude on Minaris. Um, so, yeah, I think overall, like I said, it's it's a bit too similar to No Man Land how a lot of the st- stuff happens when it's like, oh, this is just their life, their, their life experiences in in the, in this movie. You know, a slice of life, but a massive like chunk of life because you know weeks go by in this in this movie all this stuff that happens them trying to assimilate into arkansas in the 1980s as a south korean family yeah it's interesting uh but then it, at some stage it's like okay i get it can we just have a bit more plot please you know can can we move stuff on and to be fair the ending is really solid i like you know the overall message the the metaphor of the minari being for family that's good um and yeah it's uh there's it's a it is a beautiful ending when actually he goes out with his son to cut the Maori. That's that that's that is great. And yeah, overall, um I have to say it's it's better than Nomadland Nomad Land in good ending. It's better than Nomad Land uh with its um yeah, I I, I guess also just with how, how interesting it is in general, because it's probably just a bit more interesting than Nomad Land. So uh, I'm gonna give Minari, I think I'm gonna give it a, a seven point five overall for Minari. What about you? Um, yeah, so I I liked this film. Um, I think yeah, maybe one of the reasons I liked slightly more new is, for example, I didn't really find the kid um, annoying. I mean, obviously, I'd find him annoying if he were actually my son. Um, you know, okay. I would definitely be getting that stick. Um, but yeah, like overall, I didn't really find like the relationship. Yeah, I didn't find any of the characters annoying, and therefore, I guess that meant I found like all of the relationship dynamics between the characters interesting. Um, I think yeah, as as like kind of a lot of the shots and like stuff that looked pretty looked pretty and i like that uh emotionally yeah most of it it did hit with me um and you know i think like some moments were supposed to be funny i think i probably found them funny moments were supposed to be sad i think i found them sad i do think that the ending with like the uh the fire thing was like very cheesy but then like very i guess like over overly dramatic in a not subtle way but i do think the ending was very nice in a kind of in an actually subtle, subtle way so swings and roundabouts there uh overall yeah, it was it was good, and I think because I liked the characters more new, and you know, I guess was just I think extending from that was just more able to engage with it as like a yeah. I didn't really like thing. the characters as much. Yeah. I guess maybe uh, that is my issue. Unsurprisingly, I'm going to rank it higher than you. I am thinking probably a low eight. Um, yeah, not that much higher than maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, I may be thinking a middle. Maybe I'll say middling eight. Just to yeah, yeah. I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to say middling eight, and these distinctions matter a lot. So yeah, middling eight for this film. Okay, a middling eight. So let us now go through uh, our rankings. I hope you've got them on hand, Michael. Yes, I do. Our rankings. So of course there were eight movies that were nominated for Best Picture last year at the 93rd Academy Awards in 2021. Those were uh, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, Sound of Metal, A Promising Young Woman, Minari, Mank, Judas and the Black Messiah, The Father, and of course the, the winner, which was Nomadland. So uh, we started reviewing these movies in January. It's now April. We have reviewed all uh, eight that were nominated, Michael, and it's time to it's time to rank them. What we think deserve to be number one, what deserve to win. Uh, so yeah, let's go through them. So what is your eighth? We'll go from worst to best. What is your eighth ranked movie? What is the worst movie from no last year's best picture? No surprises here. It's a promising young woman. Promising young woman. What did you give that out of ten? I think I gave it. A, a, see, I can't actually remember. I'm not gonna lie. Um, wow. But I think it was a three or a four. Okay, well, I have given Promising Young Woman a 3 out of 10, so I think you you were probably similar. I think yeah. you gave it a 3 as well. So, next up, what was your 7th ranked movie? Uh, next was The Trial of the Chicago 7, which I think I gave a 5, okay. a low 5. I gave Trial of the Chicago 7, 3.5, and, uh, and of course that's half of 7, which is great. And yeah, it's my 7th ranked movie from from last year. So, uh, it's incredible. Best Picture nominee, a 3.5 out of 10, and a 3 out of 10 for me. Yeah. And of course, you are pretty similar as well. Uh, so next up, Michael, what is your what was your sixth ranked movie? Nomadland. Yep, same Nomadland. That and I think what? I gave that a six. I gave it a six as well. So yes. yeah, it's six out of ten for the sixth place movie. And of course, that won Best Picture. So we do not agree it should have won Best Picture. Yes. We we think it was quite a way off from winning Best Picture. Uh, so what was your fifth ranked movie, Michael? Mank. Mank. Same for me. What did you give it out of ten? I think I gave it a low seven. Uh, yeah, I give it a 7 out of 10. 
So yeah, very, very similar there. And next up, of course, Minari for me, which is number four. What's your number for four? For me, um, Judas and the Black Messiah, which I think I gave a high seven. Okay, okay. Minari for me was 7.5. Uh, well, to be fair, it's tied to the Sound of Metal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, you know what? I think Minari is better than Sound of Metal, even though I both gave them a 7.5. So yeah, Minari, Sound of Metal, 7.5 each, but I'll rank Sound of Metal yeah. fourth. And For Minari the record, third. the reason why I'm sometimes drawing blanks on exactly where I ranked it is because I mostly was focusing on the order, which is clearly the superior way of doing it. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, obviously, I rank, I've rated my movies. I can draw on that easy because I have a list. I'm surprised you don't. But... <laughs> yeah, you know what? I stopped. I'm not going to lie. I stopped. Um, I stopped doing the list thing like a while ago. Basically, okay, when right. I stopped like ranking all the films relative to each other was when I stopped doing the list. I probably should take a note of it. Yeah, I've got them all, all here. So yeah, Sound of Metal for me for Minari 3. What was your third rank? Uh, number three, uh, Sound of Metal as well. Okay. Which right, I think so... I also gave a high seven. So what, sorry, what was your fourth place? Uh, oh, Judas, Judas and the Black Messiah. Okay, so, you, so uh, what is your second rank? Maybe? Second ranked is Minari. Second ranked is The Father, which I gave an eight out of ten. And your best film of... The 2020 was... Yeah, 2020 slash the first two months of 2021. That one, that was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards was Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, and for me, it was I, The Father. So I'm I rated, racist. I rated Judas and the Black Messiah an 8.5 out of 10. Uh, and you rate... What did you rate The Father? Uh, an 8.5, I think. Well, a middling 8. Oh, yeah, middling 8. Middling yeah. Eight. yeah. So uh, you Judas and the Black Messiah was your fourth ranked movie then. Yeah, yeah. Which, to be fair, I mean, the thing is, there wasn't much separating it because I gave it a, a high seven. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, but then I also gave Sound of Metal a high seven, and I gave Minari an eight. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I guess overall, because I gave The Father an eight, and that was my second ranked movie. Um, that means that I guess we believe that The Father should have won Best Picture last year, with our consensus. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, by a, yeah. a ranked preference system. Yes. Uh, and I would have yes. been. Yeah, I really think that would have been like. I mean, it's kind of funny because when Nomad Land won, like I kind of went into it like, oh yeah, I'll probably just win whatever. But yeah, when you actually just like look at the films, it's like, goodness me, are there some films like? Because that's the thing, like going into this Oscars, I feel, or into you know the Oscars that we're talking about now, I, lots of people I just think didn't really care. But to be honest, there are a lot of films which I would have had quite strong opinions about. Um, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, Nomad Land won was both our sixth. And yeah, both got six out of ten. So yeah, it was for us very far off winning. And yeah, it would have on rank choice preference, it would have been the father. That's what we would have given yeah. it to. Because me, um, yeah, I think the two like Nomadland and Mank are the two films which I think are very boring to have won. Any of the other films, Judas and Black Messiah, Sound of Metal, Minari, or The Father, I'd have been like, yes, good choice, and I would have been enthusiastic <laughs> about that choice. Trial of the Chicago Seven or Promising Young Woman, <laughs> the opposite. I would have yeah, been yeah. cringing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so I guess uh, overall. Yeah, but I, I would, of course, gone specifically for Judas and the Black Messiah. But yeah, of course, couldn't complain of the father uh, did did win. But yeah, so I think for, for last year, some most of the movies, I think, like Nomadland, Mank, Sound of Metal, Minari, those four for me, for between 6 and 7.5, were like, eh, they're kind of decent. They're kind of, I can understand why some of them got nominated for Best Picture. Like, But yeah, they were like, eh, they were fine. It wasn't, wasn't really great, like, the, you know, there wasn't a lot of depth here, and of course The Father and Judas and the Black Messiah, my top two were like, oh yeah, I can imagine, I can see why these were definitely nominated for, for Best Picture, I can see why these were on, on that list, and yeah, obviously, like you say, Trial of the Chicago 7 and Promising Young Woman, how did they get nominated for Best Picture? We will, we'll never know. Actually, well, we, we, we will know, it's, it's, it's obvious. Yes. But, uh, bloody, yeah. bloody libs. Bloody, the libs are at it again, but Speaking yeah. Speaking of libs being at it again. What? It's just the, the next film we're doing. Oh yeah, well yeah. I guess that that it's it's time to wrap up. Our Oscar season is over, Michael. Yeah. The most wonderful time of the year is dead, and yeah, now we have to wait until next year when the winter comes next year, and we'll review this year's Academy Awards, uh, the, the Best Picture nominations. But anyway, Michael, th- of course we have to move on. It's a, it's a sad time. Oscar season is no more. But I hope the the drop off between our Oscar nominated Best Picture movies isn't too severe to the next movie we are we are reviewing. So what is the next movie we are reviewing? Next Hopefully movie. It's not- Next week we're reviewing. I'm actually quite excited for it because I've seen it and I think it's very funny. Um, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald in anticipation for Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. The Secrets of Dumbledore, yes. They're really uh, bad names. 
Okay. Well, anyway, you know, let, let's see what happens in uh, Fantastic Beasts uh, the Crimes of Grindelwald. Uh, again, I hope it's not a too big a drop off to these Oscar nominated movies, but you'll have to see when yes. we review it next week. So thank you for listening. We have been selecting and reflecting on The Father and Minari and indeed all of last year's Best Picture nominees. We're done. The Oscars is no more. Uh, join us next week for Crimes of Grindelwald, Fantastic Beasts or whatever. Who have you been, Michael? I've been Michael. I've been Luke. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.